So it's a great pleasure to welcome you all, the few exclusive group, uh, to this uh, uh, Helix lecture, and specifically to uh, Theresa Simon for helping us organize this and put this together. It's also a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, who I'll say a few more words about him later, uh, Michael Mosesian. Now, a few of you will know that I am Armenian, and with a complete coincidence, I came across Michael at a lunch with some president of some country uh, somewhere in the world. And we had a, he was sitting beside me, and I very quickly picked up his wit I think we were both very cynical of what was said around that lunch table. And, uh, and I met him since, and it's a great pleasure to have him speak today, but also a great privilege and honor to have him as a visiting professor at the Institute of Global Health Innovation, where the, it encompasses a number of different centers, but the, the one center that we've been very excited with in the last couple of years is a center called the Helix Center, which is a joint venture between the Royal College of Arts and the Imperial College, mostly around the School of Medicine, but there are other faculties involved in this, like James is here from the Faculty of uh, the Business School and the Faculty of Engineering. Why, why did we create Helix? We created Helix because we truly believe that design has a major role in helping patients uh, pass through the pathway of their care. In a, through a design that is more centered around their needs rather than historically where most pathways of care were designed around the needs of those who are delivering care, in other words, the doctors and the nurses. So healing has been very exciting, and some of you would have seen on the way in a pod uh, just around the area facing the medical school where penicillin was discovered, not that far away, the end of this building. Uh, and just below it is where Helix uh, Center is. So back to Michael, uh, a very distinguished architect. He has a fairly long CV. My French is not great, but he's obviously done most of his uh, education in France. He's a graduate of the Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Bon de Art. Did I say that right? Probably terrible. And also the Harvard School of Design. Uh, he is also the recipient of the Villa Medici or Le Mer Fellowship at Cooper Union School of Architecture. This goes on, be a while. He's also an associate director and a senior designer at Skidmore Owings and Merrill, which he led a team that completed the winning design for the new NATO headquarters. An amazing achievement, don't tell Putin. Uh, Michael has also been the design principal at his firm, uh, Mosesian Architecture, since its founding, it's about 11 years now. And uh, also, Mosesian Architecture has won bids to design numerous buildings around the world, uh, including the two buildings in King's Cross Revitalization Project. Some of you will know of our work with DeepMind. He was telling me earlier that he's designing their building as well. And deep mind with all that artificial intelligence power which underpins it must have put machine learning into the system to come up with Michael's name and the favorite designer. So well done on that. I've also come across some of the wonderful architecture he's done in the Mishera building which is in downtown Doha uh, and he's well known in the Middle East but specifically in Doha and uh, the uh, also the Medina of Fez in Morocco, and finally the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, the other thing which is not here, which I remember discussing with Michael when he asked me where I worked, and I said I worked in St. Mary's. And some of us who work in the big building, the hospital building, which is, this is the medical school, uh, just across the canal, uh, some interesting people lived in the canal. I don't know if you know, Richard Branson lived there for 18 years in one of the barges. Uh, until he signed the contract in Tubular Bell, so very fortunate area to live. And then across the canal, there's the Marks and Spencer's building, but if you look on the right, there's a beautiful building, which is a residential building. Uh, office. Office building, is it? Absolutely beautiful. 
And we always look through the canal at St. Mary's, which is about 30 years old now, and always wish that one day we will have a hospital constructed in such a beautiful way. Uh, and I'm sure we can seek your help and advice in years to come because uh, there's a huge development on the Paddington campus. You probably know the Royal Mail site has been sold. There's a huge development there, and the hospital is planning how to deal with that whole landscape change. And most of our patients were very loyal to St. Mary's, are very keen to see the development of St. Mary's, so we may seek your help after. Michael's talk today is about sharing space, uh, and he has a very interesting way of thinking through that, and we have a lot to learn from that, because space and the space we live in has a huge impact, whether you're an academic, you're trying to create the right space to really encourage the creative thinking of the very bright people who work with you, or whether you happen to be working in a hospital, how space could really be therapeutic to the patients who have been undergoing major treatment. So on that note, Michael, welcome. Thank you for your time, and thanks for being here, and also thanks for Teresa. Thank you. Am I on? Yes. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Ara. Um, and I think just to add to the Helix Center that to me is probably unique in, uh, in bringing together medical issues that we all, uh, we all uh, face one time in our life and design and how it could help um, to, to, to uh, prevent or to cure through artifacts, objects, um, some disease. And there's some fascinating projects, like about seven, I understand, so far, that help kids with asthma or kids with obesity, well, and, and so on, and bring the World College of Arts to design for those uh, issues. Uh, now, me coming in is really not, uh, as an architect of non-objects, because I claim sculpting voids where you put s space, you create a space for people. It's really about working, living, and playing. I'm not making objects, so I'm basically creating a space for things to happen. Uh, in my backyard actually came from Teresa as a title. I think it's a fantastic uh, NIMBY uh, philosophy that we all suffer from. And it's ironically to see, to, to understand that uh, when it came about was to maintain and pronounce further our selfishness of use and abuse of technology. My, in my, not in my backyard, it means like you don't want to have a nu nuclear plant or a, win, a windmill pole in your view of your garden, right? Or just, just next to your house, where all those things like actually putting further isolated in your house because it brings you electricity and comfort. So there's a paradox of our time that we're going to try to, um, to address today, how to go back to uh, first slide, please. This great notion, this great moment in time when the Romans were invading Europe and creating an incredible space of communication, they made sure that they brought with them something else to enjoy being together. And what a better example than the terms, the, uh, the terms of curricula, which is like majestic space for people to celebrate the five senses, where they could bathe, meet, touch, feel, smell, and probably drink. Um, this is a celebration of culture, of, this, of the city's culture that started. And there may have been great uh, inventors in, in war machines, but they were leaving behind amazing uh, spaces for people to be together. So it took us about 20 centuries to bring water and gas, electricity, to every flat, every space you can live in. So basically that increase of technology started to pull apart people. And that's the 20th century history. We brought this selfishness in the middle of our collective. So all of a sudden, we can do everything without being with people. And this came also further along. Though the 20th century was really good at uh, providing uh, comfort at the heart of your home, 
and this is bringing an incredible mob mo mobility at, the, at every, every, any time, everywhere, any place to come to this type of scenery that you see every day, which is a little bit exaggerated, but this is shared space with people together alone, but they're communicating. I am, I'm amazed to see also that my children today don't need to have a sense of, of owning anything else but an iPhone or a phone, but they share everything else. They have no sense of property. They can share anything. As long as they have their iPhone, the only sense of properties resides in this instrument. It keeps bringing us together, but apart. And there is a sense of space that has to be, again, redefined to qualify the, the nature of the relationship. So as an architect, we believe that, and I'm not the only one, huh? quite a few in the room, that the quality of space conducts the behavior you're going to have and kind of influences the quality of the exchange you're going to manage. Um, next. Look at this guy. This is a Googler. We don't know at this stage what he does. Is he living there? Is he working? Is he playing? This is ultimate selfishness. That technology also allows, nevertheless, to communicate better. Okay. Now let's go back to uh, another step of history. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We all admit that uh, those things are coming in a way in the heart of our families. Or in, uh, in, in we, we, it's like it has elements of addiction. It has elements of you know, keeping people apart in the heart of the family. And everybody admits that uh, those instruments that you never leave are changing your relationship at the heart of your core values. But OK, so now they also invent ways to disengage with it so you can go back to it. So technology will always reinvent itself, but not necessarily providing the solutions that we believe that are better naturally, right? It's OK, next. This is a very important image that of the 18th century that was repeating a bit the, 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 the terms of Caracalla. But here is not about washing, it's about bringing more knowledge to the collective. This is a, a visionary architect, Boulet, from Paris, 18th century, when the, the offer of universal knowledge and books and education was given to all. There was also another offer there. It was like an architect was tired of drawing facades for the, for the king. Like all architects were elected to draw the facades. The engineers were doing the piping, the structure, the infrastructure, the, the sewer. And then architects were asked to do the facade. Boulet said, I'm going to bring the city in the building so the engineers are working for me. But also, the proposal was to open the space for people to share knowledge. And so one of the first time in the history of drawing and representation that people were drawn in an, in an architectural drawing. So it describes like the synthesis of what are we calling for, a space where you can bring people People have a scale, it's monumental, but you feel, it feels like at ease, and you can uh, basically share and build a culture. 20th century, what have we done? Train station, shopping mall, and uh, airports. Spaces where, you know, you can ask yourself, you meet people that you hate to see in your way, preventing from catching your plane, preventing from uh, getting, buying your, your goods and preventing from uh, catching the train. So we created out of this beautiful proposal, big space where you bring people constantly and they hate each other. They have, there's, no, there's no, I mean, it's only places that you can be if you buy a piece of time or a piece of, of space of communication, transport. Mo mobility became like, the essential engine of our civilization of the 20th century, post 20th century. And um, this creates problems, doesn't it? Because there's no such a space where you can be without having, having a ticket for. Okay, so. so it's extreme collecti collectivity of mobility cre creates a high density of solitude of people, lonely people amongst others. 
And to the point where actually the nomadic conditions became reversed. We know that the 20th century has created a lot of nomadic migration due to political uh, disasters in Europe. But today, and recently, nomadic are the rich people. They're those that can actually use planes through their laptops or devices. And the sedentary are the people that cannot travel. But it's, it's, I see, you'll see, we see later that actually this model is being reversed right as we speak back to the traditional nomadic and sedentary issues. But if you take those two concepts, <coughs> I think they are fundamentally the archetypes of architecture. So next, you know, the sedentary, which was logically staying and using the earth for what it gives you, coolness in the summer when it's hot and protection in the winter when it's cold. And then the other part of us, which is like this instinct or DNA, you know, apparently it's in our DNA, we have a gene that promotes you know, movement and uh, curiosity of discovering uh, new territories. So the tent and the cave are the two archetypes of architecture. And I think we can um, see how everything is organized, either under the sense of protection or the sense of the thrill of discovery. So today, you know, you have Architect, the architecture is a protective envelope. Again, we try, we're talking sustainability, how to make bigger space to consume less. But we also, at the same time, produce this incredible machine, technolo technologically driven to spend more energy and more, more, um, more engineering to defy nature and to go where, to boldly go where no man, no man has gone before. Okay, thanks. And that drives us also on Earth at pushing the limits of height where we're questioning the values of <coughs> cities or do we don't question the values of cities. On the contrary, we think that cities is the only sustainable model for the future to accommodate the fact that by the end of the century will be probably 90% of, of the world population living in in an urban environment. So we have to address this notion. Let's go. We, along with the sophistication of our knowledge of other type of flows that we're going to be subject, we already subjected to, which is the human disasters creating these massive flows and a natural disaster creating those massive flows also of people that have to be moving elsewhere. So that ch is going to, this is challenging already Europe. This is challenging uh, in Britain, Great Britain. There's a referendum about it. Uh, this is not the, this is the fear of all. This is happening in America with Trump. It's, uh, so these are questions that uh, we're going to be pretty strong collectively to answer. Otherwise, nothing I mean, we're just going to start to build separation and walls uh, to protect what we've got, and it will be frozen forever. Uh, so this, this is like a, another uh, call for reinventing ourselves. So in a way, if we don't share, we're going to die. And this is like the only way to reinvent what we have as core values for the future. Okay. Traditional architecture is a representation of power. That is no secret. Um, I think also, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, not going to lecture, I just address the fact, the fact that objects are not as important as a, the space that you can contain, uh, contain people with. But this can generate also, uh, next slide, some uh, spaces that are very uh, loved from the 19th century and before. And in a way, this is the only space in a city where you don't have to pay to be. You can be freely without having to consume. And three examples, three cities, uh, New York, London, and Paris, where they, inv they, 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 they invented this concept of being off the roads, with off the carriages, basically off the mud, to be uh, showing your beautiful uh, dress or your, uh, being comfortable with your family. Um, this is a concept that we need constantly to reinvent, I, I believe, in creating those spaces. Don't need to be big, 
that can be small, but where you feel like you belong and you don't have to buy your admission to it. Okay, so space of fear. This goes because we know that architecture can be. What I do, one one of the big concepts I learned from Bruce Graham in Chicago was like, whatever space you design, you have to make sure that uh, you feel comfortable whether you in group or alone. But we know that architecture can be also the scenery of terror, but also the next one, please, but also a thrill. So it, we can be extremely happy to be all together. And next. Um, but we always respond to the consumption factor. And that's good. I want to go faster. Um, and then the, the, the other consumption of our shared values tend to create objects with no ground. And without a ground, there's no meeting, there's no people. So this is just uh, creating a world of solitude. So now let's, let's move on to what is uh, in my backyard. Today, we, and London especially, has the amazing capacity to bring different models to superpose to each other. If you go to the next one, I put ladies first, you see that more like the, the tenor of who are those people making the cities today or the, the lifestyle. Between a gentleman that uh, you know, pre pretty much uh, generated after the great fire most of London through the private estates, but creating those beautiful squares, parks, and galleries, or the businessman that uh, generates, you know, promotes the city as a good investment for real estate and uh, towers, or the guy in t-shirts that you know, and or the entrepreneur. We don't have to design for one of them. They're all together today. We don't have to uh, classify people by the, their ori origins or their religion. It's by the way they acti activate basically the function of communication and work and the way they live. So there's, a, there's not one way or the other. I think uh, th there's a lot of issues that each of these people represent they, and addresses different spatial concepts, but these are the main protagonists of our, that I, that I can classify, maybe others, but that are driving basically the, the, the way our cities look. It's all basically private enterprise, isn't it? That, okay? Now going back to um, the shared values and the shared spaces, let's go to uh, the grand space uh, that celebrate the fact of being together. Let's go. Okay, we've seen that. And then something that extra amazing happened last week, uh, uh, the previews of the Venice Biennale. Just before the preview started on Wednesday, Tuesday, Alvaro Cesar came back 35 years after to see a project he's done with Aldo Rossi, um, Aime Monino, and Rafael Moneo. Four radical architects of our culture as architects that f 35 years ago did uh, in the Judica r social housing, like the most radical, simplistic means of building homes for people. Series of bars, very narrow, with space in between, and not f floating object bars like the, the you know, modern movement told us to do. Those buildings looked a little bit decayed, but then, Alvaro Cesar is 90 years old, beautiful face, completely sculpted by time and passion, was there coming back to finish the master plan. So the Portugal was doing their pavilion showing in the construction site, Alvaro Cesar going back all, during the last year to all the buildings he's built in the last 50 years, in Berlin, in Paris, in, in, in Spain, in Portugal, so for housing for the poor. And we could see the building. We had the image of, uh, you remember this building in Berlin, Bonjour Tristesse? There was actually a beautiful wa white wall and curved. And all of a sudden, like, somebody put a, a, a graffiti on the top. We I had this memory of this building, beautiful, white. Today, it's falling apart a bit. It's concrete, it's gray. The, the graffiti is still there because it has been sacralized. 
but it looks like a little bit sad. Then we see Caesar in the kitchen of the people living there, and they are irrad you know, irradiating, uh, they expose the, 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 the joy and the content of having lived there for 30 years to Mr. Architect, Mr. Master coming to them, and they couldn't believe they had them in their kitchen and how happy they had been. So there was a, a, every room, a building visited by this old man, you know, sharing a piece of time in their space, in the kitchen, having coffee, tea. And as they were reviewing each of these uh, rooms, there's quite a few people there, the inhabitants of the place where it, this event was happening were preparing lunch for the whole world delegation coming in, all the journalists and people coming from all over the world. So this is the, the poor people of uh, uh, Venice preparing uh, spaghetti and meatballs for the world-class people you know, coming to see. I thought it was beautiful. The space celebration of people, the fact that this, those guys are very proud now of what they've done. It's, it's in a way, in my opinion, um, somewhere where architects lost their radicalism of you know, one working for the poor, uh, which you no, know, we can address, but uh, today it's not, it's not even an, a question, a possibility. It's uh, the people, the, the, the building providers for housing is privatized. So it's got to be corporate. It cannot be uh, going through the public institution of the cities, so which is like something we need to address for London, for example. Okay. Another thing that obviously is a momentum of our time, uh, the last Venice Biennale, um, and its creator, Alessandro Arevenda, proposed these incredible concepts. If you can't afford to have a full house, why don't you build yourself half of one, half physically, not a small house. So you build what you can afford today, you complete over time. So this is like an incredible, amazing, you know, twist of, uh, of, of resources, means, and capacity that leaves the people to grow in their own shell. And this is for South, South America. But, okay. This is a, uh, okay, so now I'm going through the, the living, for example. This is a series of concepts that we're developing right now in the office, but is uh, understanding that, uh, in a way, uh, the housing crisis is really about how to bring, to, be, to make a, a space for people, especially young people, those that uh, are starting in, um, after the education in their professional life, how they can be part of the city and not part of the parents' homes or the suburbs further out how they can you know, benefit from the collective. And I've done this concept 20 years ago or 25. It was a European competition where we were saying that uh, you can share everything except your toothbrush. So every person having a room, a bedroom, should have its own bathroom. And that should be completely a private entity. But the benefit that you can bring as, as your private bathroom with your toothbrush, you can bring a public space, a space that you share with others. So the more of you are, the greater the space gets. And that was the idea of uh, trying to create both worlds into one envelope for a, a housing model. So it's obviously uh, very convenient for students. But Today, it seems that, again, between hospitality and between hotels and between, uh, between uh, affordable housing or housing that people can afford, the models are coming, overlapping very closely. So basically, owning is not important. You rent, and then what becomes very important are amenities that you can share. And this is basically the, this new concept that is coming. Uh, that is very well known in New York. but. Uh, coming to London, where you minimize the space you live in, but you maximize the, the, the space you're going to share. Okay. And this also in the working environment, this is actually, nobody can tell what it is. 
Is that a hotel? Is that an office? Is it a, an agency? Is that a restaurant? Is that a bar? It's actually all of it. It's a Hoxton Hotel in uh, Shoreditch. And these concepts are showing that you can do a, pretty much everything in the same space and you feel comfortable amongst others, which achieves, in my opinion, uh, pretty much what a space can provide. So there's no restriction. There's an offer that can ju be juxtaposed and be together. Okay. Another thing that uh, for play, uh, parks, uh, beautiful intervention by, by Big in uh, Copenhagen, where they had to uh, resolve a part of um, the city that was in social friction between different neighborhoods where, that were inhabited by different ethnic groups, uh, subject to immigrate, for kind of immigration, and it was starting to turn into ghettoization of the, of the neighborhood. And they came up with an idea that, you know, how can you make this, this place where people can actually identify themselves to it, and then bringing, uh, other than making it special by the color, bring artifacts of the cultures they were coming from. So in a way, they could identify and then create some, uh, some shift in relationship of, of the space and the use. And the next slide will show that actually how things could happen too. <laughs> so, uh, another, another way to uh, promote, this is art, uh, how to, great, to create um, intervention in public space where you can question the notion of being public and private. Here is uh, an installation um, where you bring a, a carpet into a sofa into a public space. It's very ambiguous but it raises all this question about what it is that we can share as memories, private memories, then put in a collecti coll collective, and then engage with, uh, with the others. Okay. I'm gonna show just a case study that I've done for a previous uh, London uh, Festival of Architecture, which was like looking at uh, an approach to a London issue, uh, especially in East London, and it was in Oval Town. This is the, the data composition of pretty much East London uh, between living, working, and playing, and then the, the quantity of uh, void space uh, in terms of density of the, of the East London area. Okay. So we looked and they say, okay, over time was bombed, okay, the, all East London was bombed during the last war and rebuilt with sheds and factories and, and big spaces that had nothing to do with what London was about before. So we, took, we first decided to put some grain uh, pa a pattern to the, to the block, to the other town square, and put some uh, party wall, which is like, it's another lecture, but I'm not gonna pa spend too much time on party wall, but the concept of London is the invention of the party wall. You can do anything you want within your walls that you share, okay. So we, lo we looked at how to recompose the, the living, working, and playing, uh, uh, data of East London, okay, and say, well, well what it was mono use, okay, okay, mono use, uh, residential, mono use, next, uh, commercial, or mono use, uh, entertainment, but obviously what you expect is to have a mixed use environment, so we go to mixing up and setting up a, 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 a few rules where actually the, the condition of juxtaposition if, if, is valid if you give a space in between. So that becomes the party voids. Next. Next. And we have a use and we have a void. And here we're showing the quantity of void that is about 60% of the density built. That party void will be, you know, a space in between, okay, kind of a distance, but a place of the collective. It becomes sharing places, spaces. And sharing between uses. So that becomes a very interesting proposal to evolve from what was selfishness to collective. So party world to party voids. So that's, uh, that was like a, a, a nice idea for, um, to propose maybe to the next mayor uh, for London and how we can uh, reinvent uh, shared spaces that are you know, managed and taken over by its inhabitants. Okay, next. So, okay, next. Now I'm gonna show you something that I'm just about to complete. This is the, about the end of my presentation. Uh, exciting, uh, it's in Doha, it's uh, 
creating an, uh, it's creating a square. I tell you the story because it's interesting. When I won this square, we were like about nine firms from London and two from elsewhere. Uh, there was a main square, and we, w we were all asked to do, to respond to the square. The square was already designed by Arab and uh, Ido and Eliza Morris and all. They were d did the master plan. And I won the square on an, I an, an idea. But then when I won, I said, this is stupid. How can you make a square in the Middle East? It's like six months of a year. It's too hot. So I spent four years late after that to convince that actually there's no square, but there's this concept of urban majlis, of, of, of majlis. It's a room, and I want to make an urban majlis. So it's a room in the city. So it needs six face. It needs a roof, basically. So I, can you? Uh, so I, it took me a long time to do that. So we actually, on the periphery, a majlis functions like it's, sem it's empty in the center. And, uh, and then on the periphery, you have seating and people sit and talk. So here, the scale of square, which is a, the, the width of San Marco in Venice, you will have cool pools, like spaces where you bring the temperature, which is out there, 55, to below 30s on the perimeter. In, a, in the four months, of the, 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 the hot uh, uh, month, where nobody can really be outside. Well, I felt better to design a space that can be used all year round. So otherwise, you know, what's the point? Uh, so I'm very happy because now the next one, last one, is like there was a few months back, but it's being built, so it's going to be finished. And this is something that uh, shows that uh, tra it's a transfer of, of energy to another. They have a lot of sun. They have too much heat, but they have a lot of sun. So the, sun, the photovoltaic will just basically generate this cooling uh, pool so people can sit. Uh, and it's also, I mean, and sit, but also be together, right? And so it's, uh, it's like, uh, it's amazing when we tend to always go back to Rome, when we design a new city, which at the heart of Doha, it's beautiful, it's mixed and people, the architects, were giving in a, a, enough freedom, but to give enough respect to what the, what the brief could be. And ultimately, it goes back to civilization. The heart of civilization was Rome, and how they invented a culture of sharing collectively. So we back to square one, uh, and uh, the question remains open. Thank you. spaces can create social bonds and ultimately really improve well-being, which from the health policy point of view is where a lot of the focus is going these days, moving away from the treatment of people that are sick. How we can treat Thank you very much. I'm just here to welcome then the questions from, uh, uh, from the audience. I wanted to, today's Wednesday, is that correct? Yeah. Have you been watching Versailles on BBC Two? Today? Yeah, it's a very controversial program actually. How many of you have been watching Versailles? I think on this episode today, uh, Louis XIV is designing Versailles. And some of the concepts that you talked about sharing, it goes beyond sharing for the right reasons. Uh, I'm not going to go there. You better watch it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you very eloquently took us back to that and brought us back into that. One area that I have a lot of interest is how do you change human behavior with architecture and space, which you've touched on a number of ways. But the one that really comes to mind is how could you 
how, how could architecture impact productivity, for example, but even more importantly, creative thinking? Are there certain spaces in which makes people's light bulb light up? Uh, uh, and any thoughts on that would be very grateful. Yeah, actually, that was uh, uh, the previous lecture I gave on well-being was addressing exactly those points. Uh, we, we, we know that uh, we, we become, uh, we, we, what's the expression of church? We're shaped by the buildings we live in. Okay, so over time, uh, the influence of space becomes critical to the point that you never realize how bad it is or how good it is. And you put up with anything, actually. So, but it's not true because it does influence how you relate to people. And this is what I'm trying to express by the fact that we created this ma amazing, we're putting a lot of money in airports and shopping malls, spaces that are designed, that ultimately make people very um, anxious and nervous and uh, aggressive to the point where it's unbearable. Now, in, in the, the four different model archetypes of lifestyle between the businessman and the guy in t-shirt, Okay, the businessman says cities got to build up. You got to duplicate the ground to the infinite and then do towers and concentrate them. This is more sustainable, maybe. But again, I try not to forget is like a, a, an object without a ground that has no people to meet, right? So it becomes again collective of solitude. New York is successful because it has a ground and the towers can be together as as dense as it can be because the ground is enough to take all the population. Now, the guy in t-shirt says, well, you know, my creative people, I want them to be horizontally living in a village. And you see Facebook, Google, and all the new headquarters they built are mega campuses, and they're horizontal. And they said, this is a creative environment. Is it, or is it like this nostalgia of the, of the campus they went to, to school to, which is a collection of courtyards where you can meet and then, you know, kind of flirt and then go study. So is that, is that reproducing something that you got from the old institutions uh, where, you know, you have to remember that for those that are lucky to get an education, the best time of your life is when you're a student. You have money, you keep seeing people, you work hard, you party hard, it's fantastic. So, so uh, what are the, the, the spaces that uh, promote the efficiency, the creativity, I think it's uh, the spaces that where you enjoy to be. Um, so Americans invented the water fountain, I mean, concept, right? It's like, they said, put water fountain so people come and meet and talk, exchange. So it sounds like, like a common thing to every culture. The more you share, the more you see people, the more you uh, meet people, the more solutions are going to happen before going into the meeting room. Uh, when I, you referred that I designed the NATO headquarters in, in Brussels, my obsession, I won the scheme because what I said is like you need to give a front door to every nation, whether you're America, the United States, 7,000 square meters, or Iceland, 233 meters. Okay, so, and they gave them a, a front door into a big space where people were forced to go to get to their front door, right? I mean, it's a, it's a big building. Forcing people to meet is, it was the key that made those guys to agree because when they m go into a meeting room, they already agreed. So the meeting can take place and they say yes. There's no such thing as no. So it's like basically the agora that we keep to, to have to maintain. So those spaces where you come and then you don't run away from because you don't feel like people are in your way, but you want to get in the way of, you want to engage. Sounds like the ground is the fundamental of our culture. Uh, we can go up in, a, in, a, in duplicate the ground, but you have to du duplicate the ground. It's not just a full plate. Uh, uh, thanks, Michel. That, that, was, that was terrific. Um, really good uh, tour de force. Um, I, I haven't been watching Versailles, Ara, but I have been watching Gomorrah, which uh, I don't know if anybody's seen Gomorrah. <laughs> which was set in the um, suburbs of Naples, and it's about gangsters and drug dealers, and it's quite possibly the bleakest uh, piece of TV I've seen for a long, long time. Um, but, I mean, I guess the point is that the, the, the it's, it's set in these housing estates that were 
public housing estates built in the, I guess, 1970s probably, which are fan actually fantastic spaces for mixing people, for, for socialization, for um, uh, you know, uh, f uh, bringing people together in public areas. Uh, but they've been completely colonized by, by, um, by drug dealers and, and the Camorra. And, uh, and, I mean, I guess the, the, you know, one could recolonize those spaces and, and they would be fantastic living environments. But the, the effort to do that is, is so immense. And, uh, you know, you just wonder whether, in some cases, you just have to tear down the existing urban fabric and... and Start again, and right. um, and and I mean, I, I fully take your points about uh, right. how wonderful this this design, the, the, no. you know, this this architecture right. is. But but yeah. you know, we have to retrofit it into existing no no absolutely environments. I mean, uh, I didn't show any of the projects I'm doing, but most of the projects we're doing are usually in existing conditions mm -hmm. and and historical conditions. Like the Medina of Fez I'm doing is a prime example are reinventing something that has been the same for 15 centuries. Um, no, but, okay, sorry, but I agree. This, is, this points out the interest of the subject and how, li uh, how difficult it is to capture through a flow of uh, 47 slides, okay? But I, I thought uh, another idea, you know, to be actually, uh, if it is to the collective, is to turn such a, a theme into a workshop where you all live in a neighborhood where you know there is a dead spot, but you know there is a, a place which is actually unoccupied and dangerous because somebody can hide. You know that there's, what is a collect, the, how could we do the um, nomenclature or the listing of all the spaces that we're surrounded by that we don't pay, pay attention anymore, but could be putting us at risk. And then we could propose, you know, as a collective to appropriate and to turn into something else. At, uh, you know, to the point where you create new little uh, squares, which is, you know, we all used to have a playground in the neighborhood. Uh, another thing, uh, sorry, I'm jumping to another uh, subject, which I think is, is key as we have a change of mayor, is to see in terms of well-being in cities. I mean, the, when you were involved in making the policy for the city of London, you were asked as a, as a doctor and a professor, and you brought basically your zone of comfort with you, which was essentially possibly made of medical people. And um, perhaps there was like uh, an element missing to make a proposal, which I think uh, New York with, under Bloomberg captured to say, for example, you got to have a park within 10 minutes of any homes, any, any front door. And they start to do the regeneration of all these um, uh, 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 industrial land and, 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 and chain, revalue the city. The High Line came uh, in, you know, in the flow as a star, but its system has been systematic. So reinventing those spaces that are already there is absolutely the only solution. It's a recycling, but valuing and making them symbols of a collective uh, sharing and also the, this, this question of uh, mobility, which is not, mobility doesn't mean transport, it means like moving to stay. <laughs> so it's like immobility got to go along with mobility. So how you make people move naturally with their feet or with their wheels, I mean, as bicycles, or, uh, but not as engine. So all this, I think, is uh, possibly the responsibility of somebody in the city, and I don't know because we don't know if it's the politicians, if, if it's, the, it's the developers that just take care of their own backyard. And so who, who, who is the coll collective that can come spontaneously to propose a you know, solution that are ultimately sustainable and viable on an economical level? I think, as we were saying, requires a bit of a change in mindset from the policy makers that now think much more, you know, healthcare is the NHS, health is the NHS. Right? It's a broader, a broader view. Do we have a question over there in the back? Any other question? Um, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Bye, cheers. <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, you talk a lot about the 
collective spaces, but how do you match that with the uh, individual needs? And for example, the um, everywhere where they're focusing more on individualized care and um, how do you bring those two concepts together? Individual care. Individual needs and uh, individual Which is desires. Which is going to the bathroom, you mean? What is an individual need? <laughs> Um, well, for example, if you take different age groups or like different people who have different hobbies or whatever. Well, but I, you know, yes, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not, um, I, I'm suspicious about things that are designed specifically for people because it's very contentious. Who says that the older people needs that um, rather than this? I mean, yeah, maybe you are. We know access is important. But there's a few things that could be uh, defined, but others that cannot, should not be prescribed generically because it ends up by the separation of people be, by, because by age, group, ethnic, and, and so on. So that becomes like antinomic with the notion of meeting. So uh, I think that's why I'm, I was showing the, the different profiles between the gentleman and the explorer because it's, it shows that the space you have to design today cannot be just for one. You got to work for all. So, what is the common denominator that makes it possible uh, so it can be used? Um, so, it's the same thing like this square. I, it was not designed just for six months of a year when it's nice and temperature. It's got to be designed for 12 months of a year. So, uh, so a space, and there's another notion that I didn't address, uh, did not, didn't want to extend too much, is that the notion, okay, of spaces to do things, but of time where you can do them. So when you do sharing, it means like, you know, when you go from a, a time of the day to another, you're gonna see different people using the same space. And I've seen that in Shoreditch, very interesting. In my office, it's been, uh, I mean, I've been in Shoreditch for 15 years. Um, seeing the transformation of Shoreditch has been absolutely amazing. And there was, unfortunately, there's a bar that disappeared that was called the Great Eastern dining room on uh, Great Eastern, where it was like uh, at a 10, year, 10, 12 years ago, was very, very, uh, very okay bar, I mean, very well designed. But at uh, five o'clock uh, was like people from the city suits, and at eight o'clock there were people in jeans from the artist studio of fashion. And at, tw at 10 o'clock it was like all the leather guys coming <laughs> from, so if you could see the transformation at the same counter of the population for the same purpose. So I think the, the thing is to design things that can be used by all and not restricting any, right? So it's, uh, it's a good question, but you know, how do you, beca because you don't want to get, you know, as soon as you have somebody saying, this is for you, then it becomes, iso you isolate people. It's gotta be for all. Well, it's not. No, it's, I mean, it's like a common sense in common design. It's always better, you know, common sense is better design. Design by brief creates a lot. I mean, who writes the brief? This is also the question I'm asking. Who writes the brief today? Uh, is that uh, legislation, uh, policy, uh, specialist? I mean, who does a brief? I mean, I think, how, where is our common sense in anything? Okay. Any other questions? that you're on the recording. I guess this is kind of following on from that question, but I was quite interested in something you said at the beginning about the power of architecture as sort of enclosing a space and as, as a kind of presence relative to an object. And I kind of wonder in these kind of void spaces or kind of new collective spaces that you're talking about, does not the object become more powerful again in a sense because if you have these big open spaces the sort of objects that you're arranging within it are composing not you know necessarily dictating what people do but how people might adapt the space of you know a group of tables for a different activity um, so how so about like the idea of designing the object that's within the architecture rather than the sort of the enclosure 
Davis. Well, again, I, I think, again, the, the um, position that uh, you make, you know, I think what I'm saying is like when I say I'm building a void, it's a place where, you know, it's successful when it's qualified. So, so that's why I say sculpting the void. So you make it such that people are happy to be there. So whether you want to bring a dining table or uh, a, 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 an office desk, this is, this, you, you make the call. But this, you, you, you choose to be, I mean, you, either you choose or you don't choose, but you like it and you, you're there and you can do anything. Best, the best uh, spaces are those that are, uh, you can do anything in, in ironically. So it doesn't mean oversizing to make it flexible. It means like, you know, making it so it feels right. It is karma, it is uh, qualities. That, uh, so it's after that, anything can happen. Uh, that's why you have to be very suspicious. I mean, I cannot say that. You, you, you are from the medical school? No, I'm an architect. Oh, you're an architect. Yeah, so that's why you have to be very careful about uh, the notion of design. I mean, the, I think the, the industrial designs, designers of our time have been doing lots of uh, damage to architecture because you know, architects like, look like uh, teapots or whatever forms that are extremely attractive to buy but not to live in. Hi, uh, I think you know, nowadays we look for uh, public space when I can enjoy the time and uh, and turn off our, our technology. So, which is for you a big challenge for for the people can enjoy this public space and can turn off everything uh, linking with the technology, for example. Because uh, for us, architecture and design, we really want to design some place when you can uh, feel something more than you can see. You know what I mean? Sometimes the sensitivity, um, the taste, or water, we can touch, something like that. It's pretty good because sometimes we just work and work and we need to some, feel something different nowadays, which is for you a big challenge to change our uh, hard uh, day to day. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. There's, uh, it's funny, as I, was, I, I lived uh, five years in Chicago in the, in the loop, uh, this where all you do only one thing, you work. Uh, but you do only one thing at lunchtime, you eat lunch. <laughs> and as soon as it's, uh, it's sunny, the summers are great in Chicago. It's not too hot, too, not too humid. People uh, spent, uh, you know, eat their sandwich onto a square. And uh, so you realize that there's a lot of squares with a lot of water fountains. And so it's kind of a, but it's kind of a monotask, so. The recipe is too easy, and it's so it's like you know the cities in the world that are so frameworked that it's uh, almost unbearable because everybody does the same thing at the same time. It's like <laughs> it's like very efficient, but I, I do remember that actually uh, the inference the, the effect of uh, water fountains is like apparently is discharging positive ions, which is very good with your negative ions that you build up with stress. <laughs> so water is good. So I'm going back to the, the, the terms of Caracalla. We, uh, you have the five senses, and how can we, I mean, they, they brought that to our, uh, they, they, and we call that civilization. So how can we became, we became so uncivilized as we grew our technology? And uh, that's the question for today, huh? Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. So thanks a lot. Thank you.